The issue of extremism, we have to define what are we talking about when you're talking about extremism. Is it Muslims are extremists? Who is an extremist? The youth in, in, in Kenya that are considered radical, what is it that they are, they're telling us? Those who have never seen a jihadist, here is one, but I'm not violent. Islam has been in Cameroon also a mechanism to access to power. Official security agencies sometimes are accused of aiding radical groups like Boko Haram. How do we tell the difference between the terrorists and the police, if the police themselves are terrorists, or they are using terror, and they are not guided by the rule of law. The violence of Boko Haram increased proportionate to the brutality of the security agencies. We have more loyalty to our identity than to the nation. Because another interfaith focus on Pasa and Sheikh. What about women and the youth? And it's very important to understand how the border is a key element to, to, to see how radicalism will shift from a, a space to the other. We have to stop using religion uh, to push our political interests uh, towards dividing, dividing our societies. What are the qualitative differences that make us label one group uh, as a terrorist group and the other one as a criminal gang or whatever? It's very important that um, we recognize the diversities of religion and accord each one of these religions its own, uh, its own space. If you're serious about counter-violence extremism, we must understand the narrative that is being used by these radicals. Violence is only legitimized from a religious standpoint. And violence is also um, justified by political arguments. What is the place of positive radicalization in countering the negative radicalization? How can we talk the language of peaceful coexistence? How can we talk the language of celebrating diversities? How can we talk the language of empowering the, the minorities and the less fortunate? When we are talking about religion, we need to talk about it from the point of view that we are ready to critique our own society, our own faiths, and our own social structures. But just because we condemn does not mean we should not strive to comprehend. We need to keep on asking why. Well, just a broader overview of Africa. Africa is recording the highest economic growth, yet poverty levels remain very high. In Kenya, 75% of youths are unemployed and over 60% are out of school. So on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is fully uneven, we stand at 8.2. That is shocking. Young people are young and energetic, and they comprise a huge size of Africa's population. So on a more serious note, this can be a threat or a dividend. We have new overlooking threats in Kenya or in Africa also uh, because of the new discoveries of natural resources, for example. Oil, gold, titanium, copper, rare metals, all these things. And interesting enough is that some of these uh, natural resources are found in you know, areas where, uh, which are very prone to conflict. It is one of the drivers of, um, you know, violence and by extension extremism when ideology complements grievances. I like to argue that the failure of governance and the weak socioeconomic development leading to other factors which manifest and interplay in different ways create an enabling environment in Nigeria's vulnerability to violent extremism and its expansion. And um, this can be broken down into four broad categories. Uh, the first one is uh, political. Uh, the social aspect, the economic, and I'd also act, like to add the environmental. So a combination of poverty, poor infrastructure, weak governance um, sets a stage for hostilities that lead to, in some cases, the increase um, of violent conflict. The first president of Cameroon was a, a, a Pula, and he really facilitated somehow the access of Muslims to I would say economical, political resources of the state. The, the, indicate, the indicator of this is that when he, he left power in 1982, many Muslims decided to leave Islam and go back to the, sub, for their other things. So re, Islam has been in Cameroon also a mechanism to access to power. Terrorism and the ideologies that drives terrorism and violence extremism is op opportunistic in nature. 
it will take advantage of certain situations within community. If you want to address it, you have to address the issue of corruption. What makes you to, to shift from radicalism to extremism is the, the, the level of grievances that you have and the fact that you don't believe that there's no other way than violence that can make you to come back. People are, don't, uh, I mean they con they don't conceive the possibility of somebody who has been radicalized to come back, to be de-radicalized. It's a very important issue because uh, it means that all the solutions are mainly uh, security solutions. So violent extremism can be defined as political ideologies that oppose a society's core values and principles. It can also be used to describe the methods through which political actors attempt to realize their aims. That is, by using means that show disregard for the life, liberty, and human rights of others. So based on this definition, basically violent extremism can be basically broken down into three broad car um, categories. Um, it could be issue-based, so you know, environmental protection, animal rights, <coughs> anti-gun control. Um, it could be political, religious, ideological, and this is basically what we have been talking about um, since this morning. Um, and in addition to, you know, um, Islamic cult groups, there are also um, Christian, radical Christian groups, Zionist movements, et cetera, et cetera. And it can also be political separatist groups such as um, the ETA, Basque, IRA, et cetera. Um, we have push and pull factors when you talk about issues of violent extremism. Um, what are some of the push factors? Social marginalization, poor governance, um, government repressions, corruption, and elite impunity, just like uh, Chef Lithome highlighted earlier, um, cultural threat perceptions, and all these things. And then we have pull factors, which is, um, or could comprise of social status and respect uh, from peers, um, a sense of belonging, adventure, uh, self-esteem, uh, influence of radical institutions, um, extremist involvement in economy, etc. Calling people terrorists is a, is a tool of power. So the person who gets to say so-and-so is a terrorist is invoking power, is um, bringing up ideas of subordination and domination. We need to be careful about the words that we throw around. We need to be careful about what we are calling people. Are they terrorists? Are they insurgents? Um, in Kenya, there are there have been a talk of radicalization for a very long time. Um, and there are specific groups that are ascribed to be, to be radicals. But the, the challenge is really to, to say, what makes these groups radical? When the action and result is by Muslims, it's often described as terrorism. In this way, it is not difficult to appreciate why the contemporary radical, radicalism witnessed in Kenya is that whereby Muslim action is pitted against the status quo. Uh, talking about Kenya, there are some people who simply would say, the problem we have now is because of the Wahhabis, the Jihadists, or the Salafis. And I stand up and tell you, those people who don't know, who have never seen a Salafi, here is one, I'm a Salafi. Those who have never seen a Wahhabi, here is one. Those who have never seen a Jihadist, here is one, but I'm not violent. So what I'm trying to stress here is the issue of understanding terminology and using the terminology correctly. Otherwise, you are going to get it wrong. In attempts to counter radicalization, you must not be seen to defend Islam. You must not be seen to defend the traditions of Islam. You must not be seen to explain the exact meaning of orthodox Islam. Um, radicals are termed to be radicals by people who are in power. So even those ones who are in Islamic societies, um, they cannot engage with the notion of radicalism because doing so would mean that they are poking into the noses of powerful, powerful people. We cannot deny the history of Kenya that northern Kenya, northeastern province, and part of eastern province had a brutal civil war at the onset of independence with Kenya to the extent that uh, all people of my age or my father's age don't consider any place beyond this yolo going to go as if they are going to Kenya. They are saying we are going to Kenya. They don't consider northern part of Kenya as Kenya. And I think one fertile breeding ground of what you call radicalism is people have not yet considered themselves as Kenyans. 
That's why they live in exclusive, exclusivity, and it is the responsibility of the state and the people who are running state machinery to inculcate and build nationalism in its citizens. Islam goes beyond being just a religion for Muslims in northern Nigeria. It is also the culture and has been for centuries. It is impossible to negate the, the manipulation of religious identity as a crucial factor in Boko Haram's mobilization of members. By understanding how Boko Haram manipulates religious and cultural history, memory, and local narratives, we will be better able to understand which cracks need to be fixed and how to create the right counter narratives to replace those being exploited by Boko Haram. There's also a family model which we have to consider with families with a lot of children, a lot of children. This is something that is very uh, strong in the far north. Uh, and parents who don't have means to send their, their children to school, some of uh, the children will be sent to Quranic school and will have exclusively a Quranic education. This has an impact on the insertion of these people in the formal, uh, modern, I would say, possibilities, for example, to get a job. In those school, many of the children are Muslim, and they don't have the experience of uh, working, studying with other, uh, other children who are from other religions. This made them unfavorable to tolerance of religious diversity. Due to the, some cultural habits, the children are brought up in the idea that their religion is the best and the other people, Christian in particular, are doomed to perdition. Since they have no relation with Christian children, many Mahajir generally don't have an inclusive understanding of religious diversity. In addition to that, politicians have also been accused of recruiting and supporting political thugs for their own use, particularly during political rallies and elections. Uh, youth mostly from underprivileged homes um, who have very little education, no sources of income, and very little prospects of a productive future um, have often been kept on the payroll of this, these, these politicians and um, being used um, for their own interests. It is understandable that uh, the promise which are made to them, promise of buy, promise of money, can attract many unemployed youth. In this context, it is easy for Boko Haram to justify its anti-state and anti-ruler speeches. The argument is that if Sharia was applied, their situation would be different and that, and they could hope for greater professional options. When it's happening in Somalia, it's said that it's a, it's, it's a, a clan against the other, but when it happens in Kenya, it says it's Muslims against Christians. But these are the detractors of the nation who try to ensure that they bring divisive lines between the Muslims and the Christians. In the Western narrative, uh, the conflict, Boko Haram conflict, has been frequently presented as a religious war opposing Christians and Muslims. At IFRA Nigeria, we did a, um, a quantitative and uh, critical examination of the, of the available data, the analysis of combined data that we, what we found in the database, uh, suggested that approximately two civilian victims out of three were Muslims. So it shows that um, uh, the media coverage of, uh, of the Boko Haram shaped the perception in a wrong way. Uh, it gave the conflict a, a wrong definition based on a religious confrontation. And it was particularly, particularly dangerous in the Nigerian context to, to engage in a debate over which community uh, were suffering the most. Because it served, actually it serves the, the strategy of Boko Haram, uh, aim at fomenting antagonism uh, between Christian and Muslim. Of all the countries that have troops in Somalia, with the exception of Somalia, Kenya seems to have suffered more. But the question that I keep asking myself as a journalist, is the approach being used the right one? I have a concern in this country that we don't seem to look at the media, that it can also be used effectively to talk about alternative approaches. Because in this country, I can tell you, rarely do we have in the media a talk about alternative approach. It's only the hard approach. There is over-expectation on the media, but there's not sufficient thought given to the question of 
how do you enable the media to actually play this outside's role that everybody, including uh, people looking at counter-violent extremism, extremism uh, expect of the media? What are the main constraints that uh, media faces um, when, when facing, when dealing with um, the terrorism stories? There is minimal training about covering conflict. Yet, when you flip the coin, conflict is a common visitor across the country and across the region. When you give a platform to a terrorist group, when you play the Boko Haram video on your website, um, there's a, there's a, there's, I think it's apparent that there is some kind of directionality. But maybe you can give us a little bit, we can start with you, LOD, um, a little bit of uh, a sense of what you see this directionality, how, how this kind of uh, dynamic um, plays out. Uh, Nigeria is a big country and, uh, you know, Lagos, uh, the economical capital, is, is, in, is located in the extreme southwest and uh, the heart of the crisis is, 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 in, is located in the extreme uh, northeast, so they are just opposite. Journalists are supposed to, to, to cover the, the crisis uh, from, a very, uh, from very far. They don't have much information. When you are based in Lagos, it's quite difficult to get information. Journalists in northeastern Niger Nigeria, they have information, but they, 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 they work, and they, they, their work is really, really hard. I mean, they can cover the, the, the crisis, but they can also be accused by the government of being uh, supporting Boko Haram. They can also be killed by Boko Haram because at some point Boko Haram also targeted journalists, as uh, Professor Kiari said this morning. We're in a different age. The moderated media's message and the unregulated, the vast unregulated media on social media and everywhere else, the gulf between the tone, the attitude is really striking. You know, the radicals have this alternative outlet that is completely unregulated, that they can say everything they want. And the problem is that increasingly, mainstream media becomes, you know, the, the youth become tone deaf. I think above the line, you still have the agenda setting role, you should still try to moderate, but then you must also think, how do you communicate in the language? that the young people understand. If we can talk a little bit more about the agenda setting power of the media in the context of terrorism and radicalization, is this a function that you think people are sufficiently conscious of? Is this a function that is being performed well? Um, or is this just something that uh, is kind of a space that's been abdicated or people, media doesn't realize how much scope it has? It's an issue that we give priority as media, that people tend to debate and focus. If we decide to prioritize a certain issue, it becomes prominent. If we decide to downplay an issue, it's played down. When it comes to terrorism, it seems that media gave it the prominency to the extent that Kenya sat and decided that we need to go to Somalia. So it's, it's, a, it's an agenda setting. When we distinguish between a terrorist group and a criminal gang and whatever, or, or you know, a freedom fighter, how do they treat women? I think that's one way of distinguishing it, because a group that has political ambitions, political aims, will not round up 12-year-old girls for sexual assault or to hand them out as sexual favors. Um, and that's something that I would like to encourage people to think about. If in this country would label every criminal by the religion, you know, I, I don't know what will, the list will look like. Eh? So m my view is this. A terrorist is a terrorist, regardless of the religion. But I don't know why the media is always uh, fond of, you know, that tag has always to be there. How economically independent are the media houses? The government can play that subtle card. You know, if you don't tell the line, we can pull out advertising. And uh, that, that, I think, is the critical issue that undermines media independence in Kenya. Can you run a proper media house when it's a for-profit organization? Maybe not.